Thanks so much, Jordan and Tim. Thanks very much, and thanks to all the Dominican friars here, and Sister Joan, and all the, the sisters from Taylor's Hill, and all those who have advertised this event, and, and, and who have come. There's lots of familiar faces here, uh, which is a real, a real joy for me. Uh, it's an honor for me as well to be here in this church that I've loved since I was a child, to kind of dig deep into its history and its, and its prehistory. This talk is the first of a series, and there are some excellent speakers lined up to take you through different aspects of the Dominican story in Galway, including the history of the nuns. But my task is to go right back to the roots, back to the foundation of this community of friars in 1488. There is a handout, um, and brothers Michael and Anthony, they have copies of them, so if people don't have a copy of the handout and would like one, just put your hand up and, and the brothers will come to you. Now, you'll probably have noted, as Father Jordan mentioned, that this year is the 800th anniversary of the Dominican friars arriving in Ireland, but they only arrived here in Galway 536 years ago. They were in Cork, Kilkenny, Limerick, and even Athen Rye within a few years of arriving. So why did it take them 264 years to found a priory in Galway? It kind of wounds our Galwegian pride to recognize that. That's one of the questions we'll be asking tonight, but there are other questions. What were the immediate reasons for the friars establishing this priory in 1488? What sorts of connections did they have with the world around them? What kinds of things did they do when they got here? And what would, they, what would you, if you could travel back in time, what would you have seen and heard if you were on this site in those early days? There are some of the questions we'll be asking, but in order to answer them, we're going to have to set things in context. We're going to have to go back a bit further in time, earlier in the 15th century. We're going to have to think about other places as well, especially Athen Rai. And we're going to have to think about the Dominican order more generally, especially how Dominicans reformed themselves when standards dropped, because that will be key to understanding how the coming of the friars to Galway really was a new dawn, a moment of energy and hope. All of this is going to help us fill in the picture of the Dominicans' arrival here, and we need to do this work because there's no first-hand account. There's no chronicle of the friars here. We don't even know, as far as I'm aware, any of the names of the Galway friars in the pre-Reformation period. That shows kind of how little we know. But we will nevertheless be meeting an interesting cast of people tonight. A friar like Master Morris O'Muchan, lay people like Margaret Balloch Lynch, Edmund Lynch, Selina Lynch, John Lynch Fitzstephen. Are you noticing a, a trend here? The Lynches were, of course, one of the 14 tribes of Galway the Anglo-Norman and Anglicized families which formed Galway's merchant oligarchy. And the Lynches will be dominant in this story, but there'll be, there'll be some Blakes and Frenches and Martins too. Now I should mention at the outset that I am an amateur historian, and unlike some of the speakers uh, later on, next week uh, we have Dr. Brona McShane, and then we'll have Alton Lally the following week, I think, and they're proper historians. I'm very much not. There are probably people here tonight who know a lot more than I do about the late medieval history of Galway, but I've done my very best to base everything I'm saying tonight on reliable scholarship, and I've given you some of my main sources on the last page of the handout. Nearly all of what I'm going to say tonight can be found in one of those books, and I'd recommend in particular this very recent publication, very slim little volume, by Rachel Moss, who's a professor of art history in Trinity, and Colman O'Clobby, who's a monk in Glenstall. It says, Modest and Civil People is the title, Religion and Society in Medieval Galway, and it's a really elegant little book. Um, so, I'm just going to draw all these different bits of evidence together to tell uh, a story that is, I hope, a little bit interesting. I should say as well that two of the works listed on the bibliography are now available on our website. We've scanned them with the help of the Irish Research Council, and they're freely available for anyone to download, especially Eustace O'Haydon's volume, The Dominicans in Galway. So if any of you want to follow that up, you can download that book for free uh, on our website. The first thing to make clear uh, in this talk is exactly what a friar is because I've been using that word a little bit, but maybe you're unsure what it means. There were other forms of religious life in the Middle Ages. There were canons regular, for example. If you follow our YouTube channel, Irish Dominicans, you'll have seen our video on the canons regular of Clontuskert near Ballinasloe. There were canons regular in Tume as well, the premonstratensions, you have to pronounce that very carefully, or the Norbertines as they were known, and, and we'll be meeting them a little bit later this evening. 
Canons Regular were essentially priests who lived in community and who focused on providing basic pastoral care in the surrounding area, especially running parishes. Then there were monks, like the Benedictines, for example, or the Cistercians, who had a major monastery in Abinach Moy, and those Cistercians will play a role in this story too. The focus of monks was and is manual labor and the worship of God in the liturgy, ora et labora, pray and work. And they tended to live in more rural areas. Then there were military orders who aren't around today at all, they who combined religious life and soldiering, like the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller. And there might very well have been a house of Knights Templar in Galway, near where the Hardeman Hotel now stands in Air Square, but that is actually a, a debated point. And the authors of, of this book actually disagree with each other on whether there was actually a house of Knights Templar. So there are all these varieties of consecrated life in the medieval church. What about friars then? You could think of friars as modified monks, but the modifications are pretty major. It's a bit like taking a, a Range Rover and turning it into a Fiat 500. Unlike monks, friars chose to live in towns and cities. And instead of having farms, they supported themselves by begging. That's why we're called mendicant friars, begging friars. And this means that friars depend greatly on patrons, on lay people who are committed to supporting their work. What is their work? Not principally the celebration of the liturgy, although that is very important. Uh, instead, and this is especially true of Dominicans, friars are focused on the popular communication of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the conversion and the salvation of all. Popular communication. That communication took the form, of course, of sermons, but also conversation and debate, as well as one-to-one -one communication, especially in the sacrament of confession. This communicative purpose of the friars, it brings us to a final difference between monks and friars. Monks take a vow of stability, a promise to stay for the most part in their monastery, while friars are meant to be itinerant, to be on the road, at least from time to time. So you could be a very good monk without ever leaving your monastery, but you'd be a bad friar if you refused to go out preaching in the hinterland of your priory, especially in the season of Lent. Apart from Dominican friars, there are other orders of friars too. Franciscans, Carmelites, Augustinians, and one or two smaller orders, like the Trinitarian friars who had a house in Adair, the friars of the Sack, and so on. All these orders of friars, especially the Dominicans and Franciscans, they took Europe by storm in the early 13th century. They were hugely popular. The Dominicans were founded in 1216, and within a decade or so, we had priories everywhere from Cyprus to Sweden from the south of Portugal to the north of England, including five priories in that early stage in Ireland. My own priory where I'm assigned, St. Saviour's Dublin, founded in 1224, and Drogheda, Waterford, Kilkenny, Limerick, and we very quickly spread also to Irish-speaking areas, Roscommon, Sligo, and so on. The priory in Athen Rye was founded in 1241 with Myler de Birmingham, Lord of Athen Rye, as its founding patron. Although very interestingly and importantly, Gaelic aristocrats played a role in that foundation too. It wasn't a kind of a mono-ethnic project. So Phelim O'Connor paid for the building of the refectory, the dining room. Eugene O'Hain paid for the dormitory. And Cornelius O'Kelly for the chapter house, where the friars would meet together. We know this thanks to a precious surviving document, it survives in a copy, called the Register of Athen Rai. It's a list kept by the Friars of Athen Rai of all the major donations to the community, who gave what when, so that the Friars could be, could be grateful and could offer Mass and, and pray and so on for their various benefactors, from 1241 all the way into the early 16th century. It's the only house that we have a, that kind of a document for is Athen Rai, and it's a really precious document. Now, there's another important point to make about friars. Houses of friars, unlike some other forms of religious life, were not independent of one another. They were part of a network of communities organized into regions called provinces and then beyond into the order internationally, communities which lived the same life and had the same mission, even with local flavors. 
and there was a great deal of contact and communication between houses, both regionally and internationally. So the fact that, for example, today in Galway, there is a friar of the province of Poland ministering here, that's not something radically new. That's the kind of exchange that was happening in the Middle Ages today as well. We have Brother Michael and Brother Anthony here from the Holy Rosary province, headquartered in Hong Kong. And again, we hear from them about the good and the bad that's going on in their province, and they learn the good and the bad that's going on here. And there's that kind of an exchange happening all the time. Why is this important for our purposes tonight? Because it explains how reform works in a Dominican context. Every form of religious life tends to drift from its original ideal as it ages, thanks to fallen human nature. Laxity creeps in. Poverty is no longer observed so strictly. Wealth increases steadily. Servants begin to be employed. Prayer is minimized. Now that decline is inevitable in any age, but in medieval Europe, it had a powerful catalyst, the Black Death, the plague that raged from 1346 to 1353. So imagine a community like the Black Abbey, the Dominican Priory in Kilkenny, that was thriving and active. We know that in that priory, um, over just a few months in 1349, half of the friars died. What a catastrophe. And that pattern was repeated in many of our priories in Ireland. So in the wake of that catastrophe, standards in religious life dropped rapidly. Many men were admitted to religious life simply to fill the gaps that had been left without too much concern over their commitment to poverty, prayer, asceticism, and obedience. And the result inevitably was a growing distance between the lived reality of Dominican life and the holy zeal of Dominic and the founding friars. But because Dom Dominicans were part of a network, this decline wasn't terminal. Other forms of religious life, like that of the canons regular, they were incapable of reform and they just fizzled out. They ended up, these canons regular, living like little lords with wives and children in their own little apartments, and no committed lay patrons were interested in supporting such a corrupt form of religious life. But the case was different for friars. So in the Dominican order, for example, movements for reform sprang up in several different places, and thanks to the regular meetings of the friars, internationally and locally, these reforming ideals began to spread. Eventually, a reforming master of the order, Blessed Raymond of Capua, was elected. He was master of the order from 1380 to 1399. He was zealous for, for strict observance, but he wanted to avoid splitting the order. You might know that there are many different varieties of Franciscans. You have the Friars Minor, the Capuchins, the Conventuals, the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, and, and so many other flavors. Um, and that's because they kept splitting based on observance and reform. The Dominicans managed to avoid that thanks to Raymond's strategy. His approach was to identify one priory in each province, which would be designated a house of observance, where things would be done properly. And eventually he believed this house would attract support and admiration so that other Dominican houses would begin to follow suit gradually, forming a network of houses of observance within a province. Now at this time, at the late, in the late 14th century, all the Irish houses of Dominicans were part of the province of England. And for the following century and more, the English houses were just very stubbornly unreformed. They just didn't get with Blessed Raymond's program of observance, and they stuck with the lazy status quo. And this had consequences in Ireland. In 1390, Drogheda was chosen as a nominal house of observance, but it really was nominal. And without leadership, that reform was bound to fail. In the end, and this is crucial, not just for the history of the friars in Ireland, but the history of Ireland. In the end, all the energy for reform came from the west of Ireland, with the support of Gaelic and Gaelicized aristocrats. And at the center of this, in the case of the Dominicans, was the Priory of Athenry. From the early 15th century on, a whole series of new, Dominican, new houses of Dominican friars was founded in the orbit of Athenry and its tradition of observance. So the houses in Longford, founded under the patronage of the O'Farrells in around 1400, and Portumna, founded with the support of the O'Maddens in 1426, they were both explicitly observant houses. They were reformed houses. 
the second of these, Portumna, some of you might have visited there, just next to Portumna Castle. Um, it's a case of a Dominican community taking over, with the approval of Pope Martin V, taking over the buildings of a, of a less energetic religious group that had previously lived there. In this case, the Cistercians of Dunbrody Abbey in Wexford. They had a little satellite house in Portumna. The Dominican friars, good entrepreneurs, moved in. We'll see that pattern repeated here in Galway. There were many other 15th century foundations in the West, all of them probably reformed houses and very probably associated with Athenry. Some of these places might be familiar, some less so. Tun Biola in 1427, founded under the patronage of the O'Flaherty's, that's near Roundstone, very difficult place to get to. I managed to get there once, but um, it's a challenging place to get to. Earler Abbey, uh, near Ballyhonis, founded in 1434 with the support of the Macostolos. Tulsk in 1488, 1448, uh, with the O'Connor support. Burrishul in 1486, with the support of the Burks of MacWilliam Uchter. Apart from these houses of friars, there was also a house of regular, regular tertiaries founded in Kilcorbin in East Galway in 1446. Tertiaries were lay people who were associated with the order and who took vows and, and lived together. So from around this time, there survives also a Dominican manuscript from Limerick, which gives us great insights into the time. It's full of material aimed at the training of young friars to help them prepare their homilies. And it's clear that they had at this time, in the mid-15th century, very high standards of education. It's clear also that they were preaching like good friars in all the vernaculars, in Irish and in English, within the city walls and beyond it. And that they were actively preaching on the key topics of the period. The importance of repentance and confession, devotion to the Eucharist, devotion to the Blessed Virgin, the virtues and the vices. And they did this, what's fascinating from this manuscript is that they did this with the help of dozens of little short stories. I don't know how you imagine preaching in the Middle Ages. Maybe you imagine them just kind of haranguing the congregation and so on. Far from it. It was immensely entertaining. And it had to be entertaining in order to keep the attention of the people who were present. Um, so these stories, they kind of circulated throughout Europe. One uh, Dominican friar, Stephen of Bourbon, he collected 1,300 short little stories um, that would be spread throughout Europe for the use of friars as distant as, as Iceland, but also Ireland as well. His stories were very, very popular. So the message of these friars was often severe, but it was often delivered also with a great deal of humor. Just to give you one example of one of these stories, it's my favorite. It's a story about a, a priest who was celebrating Mass, and he was singing the Mass, and he was very proud of his fine voice. And um, there was a woman, he could hear a woman in the congregation, of course he was facing away from the congregation, he could hear her weeping as he celebrated Mass. And the more he sang, and the louder he sang, the more she wept. Um, and he was very moved by this himself. So at the end of Mass, he went down to her and said, you were very moved clearly there by my celebration of Mass. Could you tell me, what was that all about? And she said, well, you see, Father... My donkey died last week, and every time I heard you sing, I was reminded of his braying. So that's the kind of story that they were telling in, the, in their sermons. So after the great decline of the Black Death, and in spite of a lack of leadership from provincial headquarters in England, the Dominican friars of the west of Ireland, with Athen Riot at centre, were, throughout the 15th century, immensely energetic and idealistic. And they worked closely with local political leaders to extend the influence of their preaching and their way of life. And this is not just a Dominican phenomenon. The same thing was happening with the Franciscans and the Augustinian friars and the Carmelites. Observant, zealous friars were very much in fashion in the 15th century, especially among the Gaelic grandees of the West. And this is a fact which goes a long way towards explaining why the Protestant Reformation failed in the west of Ireland in, in following centuries. Um, a Reformation of sorts had already taken place, one that was entirely Catholic and Orthodox. What about the town of Galway then at this time? Did the walls of Galway shut off its citizens from this movement happening in wilder places? Far from it. When you look closely at documents from the period, it's clear that the walls of Galway were quite porous in the 15th century. Um, and that there were all kinds of mutual influence between the town of Galway and its hinterland, above all, the town of Athenry, which was, after all, an Anglo-Norman colony, even if by then the local bigwigs, the de Birminghams and the de Burgos, had become highly Gaelicized. So what is this evidence? 
there are some wills that survive from this period, wills of citizens uh, of Galway, uh, and then there's also the register of Athenry, which I've already mentioned. And the picture that emerges from these documents over the 15th century is one of constant interaction between Galwegians and the friars of Athenry. So let's have a look on your handout. Text number one there, uh, you can see, is an example of, um, from the register of Athenry. Edmund Lynch, a venerable and reputable burgess, kind of a civic uh, official and important citizen of the town of Galway, was an intimate friend and great benefactor of the convent of preachers of the town of Galway, that's the, of the town of Athenry, I should say. Each and every friar of Athenry who happened to be in, town, in the town of Galway for any reason was rejuvenated by his hospitality and departed with thanksgiving. So note that the friars of Athenry, if they happened to be in Galway on business, this man would maybe put them up, feed them, and they'd go away uh, grateful. And then there's a list of his donations to the Athenry Dominicans, a very long list, an altar and an ornate stone window, two chalices and patens made of gold, a missal, a pontificale, which is a book for liturgy celebrated by bishops, Two sets of vestments, copes, chasubles, albs, stoles, maniples. One of these sets in many colours, red, yellow, green, white, blue, black, all in the one set of vestments. Fascinating to imagine that. And the other was blue with silver flowers. And then many other goods. The first of these uh, set of vestments, by the way, we're told in the register, cost 16 marks, which was equivalent, I had to look it up, equivalent to the cost of about 14 horses or 27 head of cattle for one set of vestments, which shows his generosity. When he died in the town of Galway, he was buried in his tomb, which he had built for himself and his family in the chapel of the Blessed Virgin in the parochial church of, of Galway in the year of our Lord, 1462. So that's St. Nicholas's. You can still go in there and see the lynch tomb. You can see the, um, in, the, in the chapel of the Blessed Virgin, and you can see the lynch coat of arms with its three little shamrocks uh, there in St. Nicholas's. Then secondly, uh, a woman, Margaret Ballock Lynch, who was the hostess of all the friars, we're told. Hospita omnium fratrum. She was the hostess of all the friars. She gave to the convent of the friars' preachers of Athenry a most beautiful chalice. She was a great almsgiver to all the friars, and not only to the friars, but to all those in any need. And then we're told she was the wife of Thomas Martin, at one time a burgess of the town of Galway. For many years after the death of her husband, she lived most uprightly in widowhood, Generally, generously giving to the poor, motivated by the love of God. So that's a, a picture of a, a woman in her widowhood, a wealthy woman who is giving to the friars and, and giving to the poor. And not just giving to the friars from a distance, but hosting them. This is vital. Then the third uh, text on your, on your handout there, from the Register of Athenry, it lists all these people who are buried under the stone, in the stone tomb under the altar of St. Dominic. So in every Dominican church, you have an altar of Our Lady, which you can see over here, and an altar of St. Dominic, which is currently behind this beautiful garden of the resurrection. Um, and there would be processions every night in a Dominican house, singing the Salve Regina, they would head to the altar of the Blessed Virgin, and then singing the O Lumen Ecclesiae, uh, a hymn in honor of St. Dominic, rewritten, in fact, by Father Tom McCarthy here present. He set new music to it beautifully. Um, the O Lumen Ecclesia, as they sang that, they would head over to the altar of St. Dominic. So in other words, this tomb, the friars would have prayed there every single night at Compton. Who is buried in this tomb? William Lynch, Thomas Lynch, Dominic Lynch, and Selina Lynch, who was wife of Thomas, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name or how to even reconstruct it, Burgess of the town of Galway. He was accustomed to give annually to the convent of Friars Preachers of Athenry one pipe of wine, that's a 500 liter barrel of wine, thank you very much, and one of fish, a pipe of fish, in other words, a big, big barrel of fish on the first Sunday of Advent, and one pipe of wine and another pipe of fish on Quadragesima Sunday, before, two, two weeks before Lent. The aforementioned woman, that's Selina Lynch, she continued this almsgiving for uh, 20 years and is buried in the tomb at the altar of St. Dominic with her ancestors. So she is living in Galway, wife of a Burgess of Galway, buried in Athenry. And the aforementioned William Lynch paid 20 solidi for the making of an image of the crucified Christ and for the image of St. Dominic. So in other words, an image of Christ on the cross and a statue of St. Dominic at this altar of, of Dominic. So every time the friars were singing the Olumen Ecclesia at night, they were looking up at a statue which had been paid for by a member of the Lynch family of Galway. And this was before the burning of the, of the priory. So 1423, the, the priory burnt down and so on. So we can date all of these people. So there are long-standing connections between the Lynches of Galway and the Dominican friars of Athenry. 
And it's not just, as I said, funding from a distance. The element of hospitality is central. And we can just imagine the relationships developing over years of conversation and counsel. And it wasn't just Lynch's. So let's have a look at the will of, of John Oak Blake. That's text number four on the handout. I leave my body to be buried in the burial place of my predecessors, in the church of the Friars Minor, that's the Franciscans, in the town of Galway, so just outside the walls on St. Stephen's Island, which is now the site of the, of the courthouse. I bequeath to the said Friars, where my requiem will be said, the, uh, will be the value of five marks. I bequeath as tithe offerings for the fabric of the chapel of St. Nicholas and the fabric of the chapel of St. Anne in the town of Galway, the value of ten marks. For my funeral expenses, so much. To the friars of the town of Galway, 28 Vergas Delitis. It's not clear exactly what, uh, what currency this refers to. To the Franciscan friars of Clare, that is Clare Galway, 20 shillings. The friars of Athenry, 10 shillings, a little bit less. To the Franciscan friars of Kenelehen, one noble, less again. To the Franciscan friars of Kilconnell, one noble. To the Carmelite friars of Loch Ray, one noble. So we can see here that a single citizen of Galway had very wide-reaching religious connections, far beyond his own parish, far beyond the walls of the town. And here's a final example from the will of John Fitzhenry Blake with the focus on the Franciscans of Galway. There's just a lovely detail here that I wanted to point out. I bequeath to, the, to, the, to each priest of the parish church of the town of Galway 12 pence. To each of the ordained friars of the Franciscan friar of Galway, four pence. I bequeath my cloak, this is the lovely personal detail, to Friar Malachi O'Dovan. So here we see vividly the, the personal connections that unite patrons and friars. This, this Blake, he clearly had a favorite friar, uh, Malachi O'Dovan, and note the name, he was a, a, a man of Gaelic extraction. So based on these documents, there's every reason to think that the citizens of Galway were familiar with what was going on in Athen Rye, with the reforming zeal of the friars there, with their program of expansion across Connacht. And they weren't just familiar with, the, familiar with what the friars were doing. It's likely that many of them were friendly with these friars, and it's clear they supported their work financially. All that is important background to the arrival of the Dominican friars here in 1488. But just before that, there are three key factors which conspired to bring the friars here. Firstly, the activity of a man called Morris O'Mohan. Secondly, the aggrandizement of Galway under the leadership of various branches of the Lynch family. And thirdly, the presence on this site of an empty church. So let's start with Morris O'Mohan, who's a hugely important figure in Irish Dominican history. If you're a subscriber to St. Martin's magazine, I'm sure all of you are, uh, a little article about him will be coming out uh, in the May edition. He very probably joined the order in Athen Rye, but his intellectual gifts led him to England for further studies. Firstly, at Salisbury Cathedral, uh, he was ordained in Salisbury Cathedral, ordained subdeacon, and then at Worcester. Eventually, he received his doctorate in theology from the University of Oxford, and he was awarded the title Master of the Sacred Page, which is the highest title that a theologian can have at the time, sometime after 1474. So he's, within a European context, he's very much top of his game. Meanwhile, there were big changes at home. In 1482, no fewer than 280 of the Dominican Friars of Ireland met in Athen Rye and they petitioned the master of the order to establish Ireland as a full province and not merely a, a grouping of communities within the English province. This was kind of a declaration of independence. The growing reform movement in Ireland, they were clearly keen to come out from under the, the wing of the unreformed province of England. This request for provincial status, it was granted in 1484 and Master Morris O'Mohan was appointed as the uh, superior of the Irish province, the prior provincial. He was now responsible for all the houses in Ireland, and he was quickly given the task of introducing observance into the unreformed houses, and a few are named, Drogheda, Cork, Yall, and Coleraine. But what else happens during his provincialate? The founding of a priory in Cluny Meehan, in Sligo, and the founding of this priory right here in 1488. So the move to Galway is, from this point of view, it's just another stage in the long-standing project of reform and expansion of the Dominican friars in the West. But there's something distinctive about the founding of the priory in Galway. So let's just have a look at the document from the Pope which established the community here. 
I've given it to you. It's actually text number seven on the handout. We're not going to read all of it out, but it's very, very interesting. To the Dean of the Church of Anna Down, we'll come back to that, and William O'Malarklin and William Mackay, canons of the same of the Church of Anna Down, mandate in favour of the inhabitants of the town of Galway, Diocese of Anna Down. So this is the Pope, Pope Innocent VIII, saying this is on behalf of the Galway, the inhabitants of Galway, he's writing to these clerics in Anna Down. The Pope has learned that the chapel of St. Mary on the Hill, we're going to come back to what hill are we talking about here, because this looks fairly flat where we are right now, uh, which is without cure, that means without a parish priest, outside and near the said town, of an annual value not exceeding one mark sterling is vacant, vacant church, and has been for so long that there is no certain knowledge of the manner of its voidance. There's nobody really knows the full story of why there is no cleric here in this church. And as the recent petition of the said inhabitants stated, so the initiative is coming from the citizens of Galway, they hoped that if professed members of the Order of Friars Preachers, as Dominicans, for whom they have a special affection, had a house in the said town or outside and near it, as a suitable dwelling for a prior and a number of the brothers of the said order, the said inhabitants by the exemplary life, let's hope, of the prior and brothers for the time being in the said house, by the constant and devout celebration of divine rites, that's the, the mass and the divine office, by the hearing of confessions, by the preaching of the word of God, and by exhortation to good life, would more easily win salvation. So this is the citizens of Galway saying, we think we would more easily reach salvation if there were Dominican friars here, celebrating the liturgy, living a good life, hearing confessions, preaching the word of God, and exhorting us to live a good life. So, who is looking for the friars to move to Galway? It's not just a big aristocrat like the O'Flaherty or the O'Madden or the O'Farrell in all the other cases. No, it's the citizens of Galway. This is a civic project, and it's vital to underline that. Why? Because it's just one of a number of other civic projects which lay the foundation for Galway's golden age. The first of these projects is Galway's incorporation as a royal town. In its earliest stage, as an Anglo-Norman colonial, colonial town, Galway had effectively belonged to the de Burgos. They ran the show here. And there's evidence for that still. I think it's in the, the building of the Revenue Commissioners. My dad will be able to tell me the Hall of the Red Earl. Is that in the Revenue Commissioners? I think it is. There's an excavation there which you can, you can explore. And the Red Earl, in that case, is one of the de Burgos. And so that's where he would have held court and issued justice and so on. It was a town that effectively belonged to the de Burgos. Um, Galway had burgesses and a provost or a sovereign and certain rights since 1396, but the de Burgos still kind of held sway here. All of that changed in 1484. So some of you might remember the 500th anniversary of that date. That's the reason we have a bridge called the Quincentennial Bridge in Galway. In that year, in 1484, Dominic Dove Lynch applied to King Richard III for Galway to become a city with greater rights, including the right to elect its own mayor and corporation. And this made Galway independent of the de Burgos, but depending instead directly on the Crown of England, putting it in the same category as Dublin, Limerick, Cork, Drada, and so on. It would now have a mayor, and it could appeal to the king if local aristocrats started throwing their weight around. And that's exactly what happened in 1504 when Ulick de Burgo occupied the city and the citizens appealed to the king's representative in Ireland, Gerald Fitzgerald, Earl of Kildare, who then defeated de Burgo in the Battle of Knock Doe. So that's the first civic project of this time, an upgrade of Galway's status. The second civic project, which was brought to completion in the very same year, 1484, was to establish independence for the parish within the walls of Galway independence from the Archbishop of Chum and the Cistercians of Abinach Moy. So St. Nicholas's Church, which you're all familiar with, had been founded by the Cistercians of Abinach Moy. And they had the right to present there a vicar, a parish priest in other words, for that church, approved by the Archbishop of Chum. And since the 14th century, the people of Galway had been complaining about this. They weren't happy with this situation at all. They wanted to appoint their own clergy, and above all, not to have Gaelic Irish clergy foisted upon them. They were English-minded uh, within the walls of the town. 
And there were continuous disputes about this until 1484, when the Archbishop of Chum gave permission for an entirely new setup, which was approved by Pope Innocent VIII the following year. So let's have a look at what he says. And it's a little bit, uh, it might make us a little bit uncomfortable, some of the phrasing. Text number six, back on page two. The parishioners, and you can see there the, the illustration of the Church of St. Nicholas firmly within uh, the walls of Galway. The parishioners of the said Church of St. Nicholas, that is the citizens of Galway, are modest and civil people, and they live in the said town surrounded with walls, not following the customs of the mountainous and wild people of those parts. Um, and by reason of the impetrations or provisions of the aforesaid mountainous and wild people, that is the Cistercians of Abbey Nakmoy and the Archbishop of Chum and all these other Gaelic uh, bigwigs, to the vicarage of the said church, church that should be of St. Nicholas, before commonly governed by vicars, they were so much disturbed, the poor fragile people of Galway, they couldn't assist at divine service. They couldn't receive the holy sacraments according to the English decency, right, and customs, which the aforesaid inhabitants and their ancestors always used. So the solution that eventually is proposed is that St. Nicholas's would become a collegiate church under the governance of a warden, and that the church within the walls of Galway would be effectively independent from local diocesan control, which is a totally unique solution to this ongoing problem. But it's all part of Galway's growth in confidence and independence. And incidentally, I think this long-standing conflict over St. Nicholas's is one of the reasons that the, Galway Dominic Galway's weren't in the Dominicans weren't invited to Galway uh, earlier, um, because it was a, a zone of ecclesiastical and political tension. And another reason is the presence of the long-standing Franciscan community, potential rivals uh, to the Dominicans, who had been founded in 1296 by the de Burgos, who, as we've seen, had a tense relationship with the citizens of Galway. So throughout this 15th century, there's plenty of tension in the air when it comes to church and politics uh, in, in Galway. But all of that was kind of doubly resolved in 1484, and the citizens, citizens of Galway were now confident enough to start something new in this place without worrying about the Archbishop of Chum or the Cistercians of Abbey Moy or the de Burgos. They had the Crown of England and the Pope of Rome supporting them. Their confidence took visual shape in a way that we're all familiar with in building projects that were patronized by members of the Lynch family. So in the following two decades, there's a flurry of, of building. The Shoemaker's Tower, which is uh, still visible in the Air Square shopping center, that was built at this time under uh, Mayor James Lynch Fitzmartin. Lynch's castle was built at this time as well out of fine limestone and is decorated with the arms of the Lynches as well as those of King Henry VI of England and Gerald Fitzgerald, the protector of Galway. A building for the new College of Priests was built as well by John Lynch Fitzedmund, and there were all kinds of renovations in St. Nicholas's Church itself. And this whole atmosphere of renewal and hope is summed up in an inscription on Lynch's castle directly under the coat of arms of the Lynches. It's a quote from the book of Job, Post Tenebras Spero Lucem. After the darkness, I hope for light. So 1488, the time when this Dominican community was founded, it was a time of two distinct dawns. The dawn of Galway City, with its political independence, its religious integrity, its mercantile influence, and its ambitious building projects, and the dawn, as we've seen, of an independent Irish province focused on the full observance of Dominican life and mission with Athenry at its center. And of course, these two contexts were in meaningful contact, as we've seen, so it was almost inevitable that something would be born from these two bright burning suns. All the more so, given that, as we've seen in the papal bull of 1488, there was a vacant chapel just outside the walls of Galway, on the west bank of the river Corrib. The church that was on this site was a very, very old church indeed. It was founded by the canons regular of Chum with the O'Hallorans as patrons in 1235, right at the beginning of Galway's history as an Anglo-Norman colony. But they had neglected it. Throughout the 15th century, it was a neglected church. After the canons of Chum stopped sending clergy, some diocesan clergy were occasionally active here, but the impression is that nobody really wanted to be here on this site. Nobody, that is, but the Dominicans. 
So remember how they had previously stepped in to the old Cistercian priory in Portumna. That's exactly what happened here. They took an unwanted site and they made it their own with the full support of the civic leaders of Galway. Incidentally, why did the Pope write this letter to the leaders of the Church of Anna Down rather than to the Warden of Galway? Because it was outside the walls of the city and the Diocese of Anna Down had jurisdiction here. Again, that's a reminder to us not to imagine the walls of the city as an impenetrable barrier. The citizens of Galway were interested in the world around them, at least as far as the west bank of the Carrow. Now, we don't know exactly what state the church was in on this site at the time, and we don't know whether it was demolished or extended. But we do know that a great deal of building work took place here very early on, and the results can be seen. I mean, it's incredible that we have such um, an early uh, um, image of this. The results can be seen in this pictorial map of Galway on page 3, uh, which dates from 1651. I mean, this is really an extraordinary treasure that we have. 1651 is the year that the friars agreed with the corporation to have their beloved church built around 1488, to have it demolished. Why would they agree to have their church demolished? Because they knew that Cromwell's forces were on their way. They didn't want this church, nobody wanted this church to be used as a fortress by Cromwell's soldiers, as he had done elsewhere. And so they agreed with the corporation, who are referred to in this document as the friends and benefactors. Uh, of the Dominicans in, in Galway, um, they agreed with them to have it demolished and it would be rebuilt exactly as it had been. That's why we have such a detailed description of the church and that detailed description matches almost exactly the picture in this map, even the numbers of windows and so on. It's really a, an incredible thing that we have for almost no other churches from the time, no other Dominican churches. Now, do you notice anything different about this church? Have a, no, have a look at it and see if you notice anything, anything different about it compared to ours. I mean, it has that, that transept, that cross shape. Um, it has the choir, the small little uh, section nearest the river, which is where the friars would have gathered and sung and where mass would have been celebrated. That is where the altar was. So in other words, it was exactly the opposite to how it is now. The altar is here now. Back then, the altar would have been nearest the river. And you have the two transepts, the side chapels, with a weird little building sticking out, which may well have been a, a hospital for lepers, a hospice for lepers, or a place where lepers would have gathered to hear mass. That's referred to, it's called a Lazar house. Um, but we know nothing else about, about that, uh, that site. Who paid for the building work? We don't know all the details, but it'll be no surprise to you at this stage that lynches were involved. James Lynch Fitzstephen, the mayor of Galway, he is the man who's reputed to have hanged his own son. You know, you all know the story of, of, uh, of, of um, James Lynch Fitzstephen. He paid for the choir to be built. So that section of the church where the friars would gather. And Dominic Dove Lynch, Galway's second mayor, who had petitioned King Richard III for Galway to become a city, he gave in his will six pounds towards works on the chapel of St. Mary on the hill. Now, let's have a think about the hill. Look again at, uh, at that map. If you look, there's actually a hill next to the, next to the church. You can see the, the hill with the cross at the top. That's the hill that, that is kind of behind the church here, uh, called uh, Fair Hill to this day. But if you look in the, uh, there's a number next to it, and if you look at the little legend at the bottom, uh, which you can't read in your own, but I, I managed to zoom in uh, just last night, and um, I let out a little roar when I, when I found out that this hill actually had a name. It was called Our Lady's Hill. And it actually gives, in the legend, it gives um, the Irish version as well, it says, uh, Crocon Champel the little, the little hill of the Church of Mary. Um, and so you see the little stream there, which no longer um, exists. Uh, that stream also had a name, Our Lady Stream. Um, so this whole place is a kind of a, a zone under, under the influence and under the patronage uh, of Mary. So really, when we say St. Mary on the hill, it, the original in Latin was Sancta Maria de Colle, of the hill, by the hill, near the hill. That's really what, uh, what's being referred to. Um, how about the size of the church? Uh, in this little book um, uh, that I mentioned to you, Rachel Moss and Colman O'Clobby, they point out that the nave of the church, the main body of the church, was the same size as that in Athen Rye. I'd encourage all of you to go to Athen Rye and check it out so you get a sense of how big the church, the church was. But the choir, where the friars would gather to sing and to worship, was six metres longer than the choir in Athen Rye. And that shows something of the ambition of the friars here. 
This wasn't just a little pied a terre for the, for the friars. It was a significant church. And the best way to imagine what it would have looked like is for you to visit Athenry or Kilmallock, magnificent Dominican remains there, or the Franciscan friaries in Clare Galway or Ross Airely, near Hedford. What did the church look like on the inside? We can't be sure. But based on other examples of Dominican churches in Ireland, its many windows, like the great five light windows, so would have had five lancets in the, the window in the east end, over that end. We have a three light window. They had a five light window at that time. They were probably filled with stained glass, probably of gray and yellow color, based on excavations in other Dominican churches. Um, and you can see some examples on the back page of your, your handout, or the second last page. Um, there might have been some figurative stained glass kind of representing Christ and Our Lady and the Saints as well. And we know this because around the year 1500, a stained glass window featuring St. Catherine of Siena and St. Catherine of Alexandria was unveiled in Athenry Abbey in memory of our friend Morris O'Mohan. And it's not impossible that the patrons of Galway Friars had similar ideas. There were very probably figurative wall paintings as well. And there may even, this is a, an intriguing possibility, there may even have been paintings on canvas here in this church. How do we know? Because the Friars of Athenry, one of their merchant patrons, gave them a Flemish painting, a painting from Flanders, so kind of in the period of the Northern Renaissance. And the Flemish, this Flemish painting depicting the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin was given to them sometime before 1484. And there might have been similar imports from the continent here. Underfoot, if you were to look underneath, what would you have seen? You would probably have seen these two-color tiles, uh, which you can see there. That kind of a style was typical of Dominican churches. These are from a Dominican church in Wales. It was recently excavated under, under a, a Tesco, I think, or they're building a Tesco, and they found the entire uh, tile floor of a Dominican church. We know, too, that there is an image of the Blessed Virgin here in this church to which the people of Galway were very devoted. So this image... The people of Galway are very devoted to Our Lady of Galway here, but there was a lady, there was an Our Lady of Galway before her. She's a much more, uh, more recent, uh, I think, 17th century statue. As late as 1587, there are indications that people of Galway came to venerate the image of Our Lady here on the feasts especially of Mary's visitation, her annunciation, her purification in the temple, and her nativity, her birthday on the 8th of September. We don't know what that image looked like, but we can guess based on the medieval statue of Our Lady, which survives from the Dominican uh, tertiary community of Kilcorban. It's in the, the Diocesan Museum in Loch Ray. So have a look there again on page four, um, the image of the, of the mother and child. That was from the Dominican uh, church in Kilcorban, a really beautiful, simple, painted um, uh, statue of mother and child. There would have been statues of other saints as well, especially Dominic, we know. And in fact, one thing that intrigues me, and, and it, you've probably been coming here many decades, maybe without realizing this, but in the porch just out here, there is a carving set in the wall, a stone carving, and it looks like Our Lady and John at the cross. It's not John. It's St. Dominic. You can see the tonsure. You can see the scapular. It's Our Lady and St. Dominic there um, at the foot of the cross. And there's debate about its dating. Um, but I made contact with a few people, and they agreed that it could very possibly date to the original Dominican church. And we've been passing it by probably for, for many decades. And St. Catherine of Alexandria also was a very popular patron uh, among Dominican friars. And there's a medieval image of her that survives from Kilcorban. Again, you can see St. Catherine of Alexandria with her sword there. She was a philosopher um, and, and greatly loved by the Dominicans. And there's also a statue of her, medieval statue in limestone in, from our church in Kilkenny. Uh, we have a big fan of the Black Abbey here um, tonight, uh, so I have to mention Kilkenny. What would you have heard here, what would have come through your ears? Eight times a day, the friars of St. Mary on the Hill would have been in this church singing the praises of God. And they did so according to Dominican liturgical books. So that meant there was a different sound, a different soundscape, if you like, in this church compared to the Church of St. Nicholas and the Franciscan Church. And it was a sound that would have been familiar to those who had visited the friars in Athenry or any other Dominican priory. And incidentally, we still sing a lot of those chants. So the Dominican version of the Salve Regina and the Olumen Ecclesiae and, and many, many more. The Dominican network, it was and it still is a musical network. It was a preaching network too, a network of mass communication. And you would have heard sermons here on Sundays and feasts 
sermons that likely included many of the vivid stories uh, that the Friars of Limerick, for example, were so keen on. And you could connect more personally with this network of communication by asking one of the Friars for a confession. The Dominican network was, as we've seen also, a social network. Friars were not cut off from the world. Their vocation was to be contemplatives, but to be deeply involved in the world around them as well. So if you were here in the uh, late 15th, early 16th century, you would have seen many people coming and going from the priory buildings. Um, you would have seen local lay people heading into the parlours for conversation. Every community of Dominicans was meant to have a locutorium, a talking room, a parlour, where people could come and chat with the friars. You would have seen friars heading over the bridge into the town um, to call in on their friends. And in Lent, above all, you would have seen friars here packing their bags to go on preaching missions well beyond Galway, preaching at roadsides and market crosses and celebrating the sacrament of reconciliation. Based on everything we know about the friars elsewhere, we can be fairly sure that these friars were not exclusively English-speaking. They're likely to have included many members of the English-minded families of Galway, the 14 tribes, but there were surely friars of Gaelic-Irish background as well, as we find in Athenry and as we find among the Franciscans in Galway. Now, this way of life was inaugurated here in 1488, but we know that after just three decades or so, Henry VIII's project of dissolving the monasteries began in Ireland. It had immediate impact in some parts of Ireland. So my own community, St. Saviour's in Dublin, we were unceremoniously booted out of our site on the north banks of the Liffey, and lawyers immediately moved in, which is why the four courts are on that site now. But the friars in Galway and in many, many other parts of the West, they escaped that fate for several decades more. It was only in the 1570s that serious efforts to implement the Protestant Reformation took place here. So in 1570, the Corporation of Galway took over ownership of the site. Now that's sometimes interpreted as the town turning against the friars, but in actual fact, I think it's likely to be the other way around. I think it's, it's hard to know what it means, but it's quite likely that the corporation was actually shielding the friars rather than taking over their property. So nominally taking it over, but allowing them to continue what they were doing. That's exactly what the O'Brien family did with the friars in Limerick. O'Connor Sligo did exactly the same thing with the friars in Sligo. The Earl of Clan Ricker did it for the Athen Rye friars. And in the 1570s, we know that there were friars openly going about Galway City because it really shocked uh, some officials of the English crown and they wrote about this. A little bit later on, a Protestant preacher here complained that the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation wasn't taking effect in Galway, partly because of the preaching of the friars, whom he called, very nicely, filthy frogs of the synagogue of Antichrist. And as we saw, there was still popular devotion to Our Lady in Galway by 1587. But people knew at that time that the friars were under threat. A certain Nicholas Blake made his will in 1568 and he bequeathed money to the friars here, but he added in his will, if the friars should be put out of the abbeys about Galway, then the legacies would return to his heirs and distributed to the poor. So confidence had given way to uncertainty near the end of the 16th century. But what's clear is that the first century of more or less uninterrupted Dominican life, it was sufficient, it was enough, to establish a resilient network of relationships and a resilient form of life based on the ideals of the reformed Dominicans long promoted by the friars of Athen Rye and welcomed so enthusiastically by the citizens of Galway. We see the fruit of this, not only in the perseverance of the friars in the face of persecution, which Ulton will be speaking about in two weeks, and in the birth of the community of Dominican nuns, which are, they're still around here. They were founded in 1644, and, and Brona will be speaking about them next week. But we also see the fruits of this initial period in individual friars, the lives of individual friars of the 17th century, who were shaped by the living tradition that was established here in 1488. I'm thinking of men like Nicholas Lynch, who was born in 1590, who collaborated with the corporation here to establish a Dominican school in Galway in 1625, who traveled to North Africa to ransom his brother, also a Dominican friar, who had been enslaved by pirates, and who, as provincial of the Irish Dominicans, labored at the court of the King of Spain to provide resources for the preaching of his confreres throughout Ireland. I'm thinking of Dominic Lynch, 
who began his Dominican life here before being forced to flee to Seville, where he became one of the most important writers of theology and philosophy of his time. He published numerous tomes which were studied throughout Europe. And when he died, there was an enormous funeral for him in Seville, and the funeral oration preached there um, was, was actually printed, and it's still, it's still can, you, can, you can read it online, and this preacher says, O oh, dolor, what a sadness that Dominic Lynch has died, a sadness for all the people of Seville. But his Dominican life began here. I'm thinking of somebody like Lazarus Lynch, who returned here to minister after studies in Lisbon and was said by his contemporaries to have lived an angelic life. Or Peter French, who studied in Spain and went to Mexico as a missionary in the 1640s, who learned one of the indigenous languages there, possibly Nahuatl, and wrote a catechism in that language, preaching before returning once again to Galway in his old age and uh, preaching in the languages of his youth. And finally, I'm thinking of uh, Daniel O'Houlihan, really one of my favorites, a wonderful story. He joined the Dominicans at a young age, and at the age of 16, he was on his way in the habit to study in a priory in Spain, but he was waylaid, and he ended up in London, where he lost his way completely, met a girlfriend, met a girl, moved in with her, um, but 18 months later, his conscience got the better of him, and he returned to the Dominicans full of remorse. He was welcomed by them with open arms, he received the habit again, he made profession, and he ended up preaching here in Galway for many decades, in Irish and English, we're told, telling the story of his own prodigal years and telling the people of the mercy of God. What all these lives show is that in spite of the persecution that was to come, the founding of the friars in 1488, this new dawn, was not a false dawn. It was sufficiently sustained and brilliant to survive a near eclipse, and it goes on shining. I mentioned that I loved this church as a child, and as I grew, it was really the preaching that I came to love, especially that of the late Father Terence McLaughlin. His sermons were my introduction to the living tradition of the Dominican Friars of Galway, alongside long conversations that I came eventually to have with the late Father John O'Reilly, and the example of faithful service of the late Brother Christy O'Flaherty. They passed on to me and to so many others the light of this tradition, for which I am endlessly grateful. Now may perpetual light shine upon them and on all their predecessors, all those torchbearers who preached the gospel of Jesus Christ under the protection of his blessed mother by the hill outside the gates of Galway. Thank you.